Amos chapter 3, verses 1 through 15. I'll be reading from the English Standard Version, if you'll follow with me. Hear this word that the Lord has spoken against you, O people of Israel, against the whole family that I brought up out of the land of Egypt. You only have I known of all the families of the earth, therefore I will punish you for all your iniquities. Do two walk together unless they have agreed to meet? Does a lion roar in the forest when he has no prey? Does a young lion cry out from the den if he has taken nothing? Does a bird fall in a snare on the earth when there is no trap for it? Does a snare spring up from the ground when it has taken nothing? Is a trumpet blown in a city and the people are not afraid? Does disaster come to a city unless the Lord has done it? For the Lord your God does nothing without revealing his secret to his servants, the prophets. The lion has roared. Who will not fear? The Lord God has spoken. Who can but prophesy? Proclaim to the strongholds of, in Ashdod and to the strongholds in the land of Egypt and say, Assemble yourselves on the mountains of Samaria. See the great tumults within her and the oppressed in her midst. They do not know how to do right, declares the Lord. Those who store up violence and robbery in their strongholds. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, an adversary shall surround the land and bring down your defenses from you, and your strongholds shall be plundered. Thus says the Lord, as the shepherd rescues from the mouth of the lion two legs or a piece of an ear, so shall the people of Israel who dwell in Samaria be rescued with a corner of a couch and a part of a bed. Hear and testify against the house of Jacob, declares the Lord God, the God of hosts, that on the day I punish Israel for his transgressions, I will punish the altars of Bethel, and the horns of the altars shall be cut off and fall to the ground. I will strike the winter house along with the summer house, and the house of ivory shall perish, and the great houses shall come to an end, declares the Lord. Let's just bow our heads in prayer for a moment. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your word. It sounds like such a terrible time, and it was for Israel. But thank you, Lord, for your grace that has brought us out of the depths of despair. Thank you, Lord, that we are those who are called the redeemed of the Lord. And now as we turn to your word, Lord, May it be a word in season. May it be a word in private to our hearts. May it be a word of public declaration of the God that we serve. You grant me much grace in the preaching of this word, Lord. For I am but a weak vessel attempting to pour forth the greatness of God. So I ask your hand upon me, and may your Holy Spirit indwell richly the words that I speak. For it is not my merit, but yours, O Lord, that I preach. In Christ Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. In 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 2, verse 2, Paul speaking says he doesn't want Christians to be shaken in their mind or to be alarmed. Not to be shaken or alarmed in their mind. But if we look at the world today, the world is in just such a place. It is shaken. It is alarmed in the church and out the church. And knowing how contagious fear is, it spreads through the world even for the people of God. I just want to draw your attention to a well-known verse that we will be dealing with very briefly, briefly this morning. But that is the theme I will be sort of supplanting upon the word that I preach. Is a trumpet blown in a city, Amos 3.6? And the people are not afraid? Does disaster come to a city unless the Lord has done it? 
I want you to look at the pandemic. As the Lord, our Creator and Defender, our Redeemer and Friend is seeing it. And His hand is within it. I want you to be sure of this truth. God is totally in control of everything in this world right now. And He embraces all those crises. In fact, He is the orchestrator of things, even of sinful men. And we are to trust Him and be at peace about it. What the Lord is doing and why He is doing it, nobody seems to know. But I have the sense that pretty soon we shall know what He is doing. Oh, we can hypothesize. We can draw out from conspiracies. We can draw out from a hundred prophecies. But I have not heard anyone not one who has convinced me they know what the Lord is doing. And I have the sense that we will know pretty soon. Now God calls a farmer from the southern kingdom to prophesy. And he's prophesying over these nations, but he's most, sorry, from the northern, southern kingdom to prophesy to the northern kingdom. The first two chapters have been about the heathen nations. Six of them. And then it focuses on Judah very briefly. And now for about seven chapters, the focus will be on Israel. And what we will see in chapter 3 and chapter 4 and chapter 5 is three sermons that Amos is preaching. This is his, in essence not so much a prophecy as it is a sermon. And in our modern day, the pulpits are more sermon than prophecy. And if we understand prophecy rightly, it's not prophesying unknown things, but it's telling prophetically what God will do when what we know we do not abide by. We reject knowledge. It is what we call foretelling, not foretelling. And Amos is doing that primarily in this chapter. Although there is foretelling in the sense of the calamity that will come upon Israel. And we need to understand there were many prophets during this time. And for many years after and before. Many prophets. Prophets who prophesied under the, the, the Holy Spirit of God. But we don't know of their prophecies. Why not? Because... What they said and spoke of is not inspired in Scripture. Just as with Paul and John and Andrew and Mark, they wrote more than just the letters we see. Uh, Andrew's uh, letter, epistle, is one of only portions have been found. But it's not inspired in Scripture, though Andrew was a godly man. Uh, Paul, we know, wrote several letters to the church at Corinth. We know of two, 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. But there's a third letter in between that we know of, and maybe more, which he calls, I wrote to you, the hard letter, which maybe is good for us that it's been lost. And then there's the Gospel of Peter, which, again, I'm glad it's not in Scripture from purely reading it, I learn more about the dangers of hell and it puts the fear of God into me very quickly. But so it is, there are many things that are written that are not canonized. They are not part of what we would call the inspiration of God. But Amos comes and he comes preaching unknowing that his message will be preserved by God and Produced, as it were, in the Scriptures to become the inerrant, infallible, inspired Word of God. And I think God did this many times to stop pride in these men. That they would not become prideful. Well, you know, one day, this prophecy is going to be in the book that is the most popular sold book and the most well-known book in the whole world of seven billion people should imagine that's a good call for pride to creep in. And Amos at the same time was not simply doing a job. He was not simply being obey, uh, obedient to God's call. 
I want to say that Amos was constrained to preach. He was driven. He was, uh, he was compelled to speak. So God uses that nature, that characteristic in the person. And at this time, Amos is compelled. And so it's not only God's word that you're hearing. It's the characteristics of Amos presenting forth. And you look at um, verse 8. The lion has roared. Who will not fear? This is not just God speaking. This is God speaking through the passion of Amos. Through the, the constraints within Amos. And he goes on. The second part is a response. The Lord has spoken. And this is Amos. Who can but prophesy? Do, do you see the passion within Amos? He's constrained. He, he cannot. He's driven. He, he can do nothing else but prophesy. It's almost as though he will leave his palm in, in whatever condition he'll find it when he returns. He cares less. But this he must do. He must go and he must preach to these nations and to Judah and to Israel. He's constrained to go. I hope you get some kind of sense of Amos from this. He's not just a prophet standing up saying, Thus thou sayest the Lord. Not at all. He goes preaching in the valleys and, and wherever he might be. And uh, we have no idea how many times he repeated his message. But certainly we have one recording of it. Amos like Jeremiah. Jeremiah said that the message that he was to preach was like fire in his bones. Oh, isn't it wonderful to see someone sharing their faith, sharing their testimony, preaching from the pulpit, uh, speaking or reading the scriptures, and, and, and it's like fire in their bones. They, they, they must do this. They, it's what God wants them, but this is what they want to do. They are driven to it. And so, we come to what... I would call covenant accountability. And this is what hurts Amos. And firstly, there's a command to hear. In verse 1, we see that Amos is given the message, but God's people are commanded to hear it. And if we uh, jump ahead to Amos uh, 8, 11, one of my favorite passages to preach of the Old Testament, um, you will see Amos is preaching with passion. Amos is preaching under the inspiration of God. Amos is preaching by the Holy Spirit power. But listen to Amos 8.11. If you want to read in your own version, it's fine. It, it doesn't change much. His preaching was rejected. Verse 8. At the verse 11 of chapter 8. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will send a famine on the land. Not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. That doesn't mean no one was preaching. It means they listened to Amos' preaching, but it never sunk in. They rejected the hearing of God's words. They rejected the preaching of God's word. And so this is what Amos is up against, much like Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. He's up against the people who do not want to hear, but he's constrained. He doesn't care. I am going to do what's on my heart and what the Lord has driven me to do, and I will preach to them. And so it's about this covenant relationship, which is a unique relationship. This relationship is based on the fact that they are God's chosen people. Verse 2, you only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you, you for all your iniquities. What an incredible sta statement. Of all the nations of the world, alone have I loved you. You alone have I cared for. You alone have I brought out of slavery. You alone have I given a promised land. It's like God saying, I in my sovereignty have elected you to a great privilege of all humanity. I chose Abraham and Isaac and Jacob to make a covenant with and create a great nation, a nation called Israel. 
Now with every privilege we know what comes with privilege. Accountability or slash responsibility. For the Christians, we enjoy abundant privilege. You're, you're adopted. You're redeemed. Your sins are forgiven. We have so many privileges that flow from that. God answers our prayers. God hears our prayers. We are guided by the Holy Spirit. We have the Word of God that we can read in so many different languages. We have almost without excuse. So with great privilege comes great responsibility. We are not saved by responsibility. We are saved by grace. But that responsibility is like Amos. We are constrained in our hearts to be accountable. We are constrained in our hearts to be responsible to this grace that is given to us. I, I struggle with one hymn that has a line that says, We are debtors to grace. In a sense, we're not debtors to grace. Otherwise, it's not grace. We are free in grace. But we are constrained by grace. We are constrained and driven by grace to live the life God wants us to live. To preach the, the word of God that God has given us. To be a testimony to the nations by our own lives and testimony. And of course, the question we often ask. Why me, Lord? What about my cousin, my nephew, my grandchild? What about my ex-neighbor, the person I worked with at work? I mean, quite honestly, they might have been better, a better person than any of us. Why, why me and not them? Well, one of the reasons is very simple. That God shows you cannot earn your salvation. You cannot be a better person to gain it. It is no merit but God's grace and kindness. No merit of my own. Romans 3, 10 to 12 is so firm on that. As it is written, none is righteous. No, not one. I, I love some of the African songs that I, I, I'm reminded of. And um, in Africa, they, they, they don't have, many of the churches don't have hymnals. So they memorize everything they sing. So the songs are not long. They're kind of short so they can memorize it. And they're often repetitious. Not because they just want to be repetitious because that's the nature of how they do things. And then there's one hymn, portion of a hymn they sing and the words of Scripture come, there is none righteous, no, not one. And they're animated. There is none righteous, no, not one. <laughs> and so it's, it's wonderful to see. And um, it's wonderful to know there is not one righteous. There is not one righteous. No one understands, Romans says. No one understands. No one seeks God. All have turned aside or astray. Together, Romans says, Together they have become worthless. No one does good. No, not even one. And you're one of those. Well, so am I. And God, in His mercy and grace, reached out from the cosmos, if you like, and He saw you and He ripped you out of the hot flames of hell and said, You're mine. And he did that with Israel. He did it with Israel. A slave nation. <clears throat> and remember this. Why is it so important? This responsibility or, or accountability. Luke 12, 48. To whom much is given, much is required or expected. Does that not apply to the churches, to denominations, and even nations? Nations who are built on the Word of God. Nations who used to have a, an allegiance to the flag, as much as America does, and I think Canada does, where 
God is in it. And so many nations have been ripping out prayer and God out of the schools. Do you, do you realize what's happening? This is not just about Christianity. This is about accountability. They have failed to be accountable to the God who put them on this earth and the God who made that nation and the God who gave them their constitution or whatever they might have, the God that gave them their flag, the God that gave them their song, that in most cases have such wonderful words. It flies in their face every day as leaders of nations and yet to whom much is given, much is required. I don't believe much is required of India and China and Afghanistan and Pakistan. But much is required of those nations that were built on Christianity, on the Word of God. Much is required. And so Israel are challenged. It applies to denominations. It applies to churches. We have been given much. We have been given the word of God. We have been given people and lives. You remember that David, King David put the Ark of the Covenant on a cart. But do you remember also the Philistines did the same? The Philistines put the Ark of the Covenant on a cart and they smacked the rump of the donkey and sent it on its way. Yet the punishment for David was great, but not for the Philistines. Why is that? The Philistines were ignorant of God's rules. They were ignorant of God's laws. But David wasn't. For whom much is given, much is required. So as Christians, as we grow in grace and knowledge, it, it's, it's a, like a two-edged sword here. You want to grow, but the more you grow, the more you know. And the more you know, the more God requires of you. That's quite a challenge, isn't it? Ouch. And that applies to the past as much as anyone else. Of whom much is given, much is required. It almost makes me think, oh, I wish I was still a baby in Christ, then. but I'm not, and neither are you. And so we see, the second point I want to make is cause and effect. We see it in the way Amos structures his words. Verse 3, you two walk together unless they have agreed to meet. Now we know that Amos is not a noble, he's not a highly educated man, but he's upright before God. And he has what I want to call good common sense. Something which isn't so common today. So from verse 3 to 8, he asks seven questions. I'm not going to go through each of those questions. That those are seven sermons on their own. And he does so by showing cause and effect. Do two walk together unless they have agreed to meet. This is a very... Uh, uh, deep dive into relationships by the way and as, as I said a sermon on its own and I don't have time to consider it but just some food for thought these are in what one writer says logical and proverbial I, I, I'm not too sure I always know that the two are the same but maybe it covers all the bases logical and proverbial in a sense that we can't miss where Amos is going that's the logic of, with all these proverbial statements. He's leading us to focus on something. And especially the last one. But I'll pick up in verse 6. Is a trumpet blown in a city and the people are not afraid? Does a disaster come to a city unless the Lord has done it? And that's, that's where, where Amos is going. He's saying this is Yahweh your God who is speaking to you. And he says so in scripture. For the Lord God has nothing, does nothing without revealing his secret to his servants, the prophets. And so Amos in one sense has been revealed to him what God is going to do. 
And yet what God is going to do is pretty logical. At some point in time, judgment must come to Israel. It must. It's logical. It's reasonable. It's expectant. If you keep on doing something, you are going to be caught. I mean, the jails are full of people who got away with it once, twice, three times. By the time you reach three, you're pretty much known in the criminal world and someone's going to tell on you. By the time you get to, to four or five, you're a rare commodity in prison because not many people have escaped many more than that. I was just reading a sad thing this, this week of a, of a doctor in French Guiana who was arrested for giving out ivermectin to one of his patients. Now, who told on him? One of his fellow doctors. It's the nature of humankind and the nature of things that uh, they, aren't, they don't remain hidden for too long. And so, the context of Amos' words here is that, is that all these calamities, God is in them. God knows what's going on. God is not the author of them, but He controls them and allows them to happen. Amos is speaking of a future disaster that is to come upon Israel and, and that God is preparing to do it. Even then, God, while He was speaking, God was in preparation to do such a thing. We talk about the end times. God is in preparation. He's preparing things for the end times. He's preparing what is to come happen, whether it's uh, presenting the, the man of lawlessness to, to the world to be obvious, who I believe even now exists, just is not known. Even the Assyrians' barbarism was a tool of God for His own uses. They were evil. And God said, I'll use your evil, and then I'll still punish you for it as well. And so we can see an example of Daniel. Daniel chapter 1 in verse 1. The Babylonians under Nebuchadnezzar have besieged Jerusalem. The Babylonians are the instrument, which verse 2 gives a very clear statement of it. Daniel 1 verse 2. And the Lord God gave Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, into his hand. Nebuchadnezzar wouldn't have made Jerusalem if it wasn't for God. He wouldn't have surrounded and besieged Jerusalem without God and he wouldn't have uh, conquered Jehoiakim without God. It was all God's hand that ended up giving into his hand Jehoiakim king of Judah. That's the sovereignty of God. Was Nebuchadnezzar an evil man? Was he a harsh a military leader? Were, were criminal things done? Absolutely. And so God considers in this the danger and the endangered. You must always remember that God has providentially brought to us all the wonders we have in this modern world. The internet, news media, some of them a little bit false, some of them not so false. But God has given us so many things. I almost want to ask how many of you have got an electronic Bible on your lap this morning? What a wonderful blessing. I don't see it as negative. People say, you know, Pastor John, I think a preacher must have the Bible in his hands. I think a preacher must have the Bible in his heart. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if you have electronic or Bible, I, I don't mind if you have the ESV or the NASB. It's God's Word. There are some translations I would maybe shy away from <laughs> or run away from. But God is watching and God knows everything. He knows the danger and the endangered. He brings about the danger and He tries to rescue the endangered. But if they will not listen. In verse 9, we see this interesting aspect. It says, Proclaim to the strongholds in Ashdod and to the strongholds in the land of Egypt and say, Assemble yourselves in the mountains of Samaria and see the great truths within her and the oppressed in her midst. Now Samaria, um, the city that is, 
was on a high plain within some valleys. And so around Samaria were mountains, and yet they still had a high place to look on the valley. And so it was a place of almost, you could stand on, on the mountains and see the city below on this plain within the valley. And so he's saying, gather, assemble yourselves on the mountains of Samaria and look down. You know, Frankie's, I'm watching you. That's what God is asking. Look at Samaria. Watch them. Watch what I am going to do. Watch as I come to bear upon my people the judgment they deserve. Stand in the mountains. Watch what is going to happen because they have cast aside my covenant. Look and see. You know, one thing Christians should be doing is looking to see what God is doing to sinful people. That sounds quite awful, doesn't it? But we should. Because God is speaking to us through these catastrophes. Now, not all catastrophes are pure judgment, but they are a consequence. Um, Haiti. I find it very strange that Haiti is a land that is so full of voodoo and evil like you cannot believe. And I was watching a video yesterday. And it happens to be a South African who travels around and so on. He's quite a brave fellow and not a Christian. And I abhor some of the things he says and does. But I find it very interesting. He went to Haiti and um, he went to, well, I suppose for the sake of his videos and that, he went to this place, this voodoo guy. And on the way there, I looked at the poverty as he drove on his little motorbike where he was walking at one stage. I saw such poverty in Haiti. Probably you might not know this, but you could go to a place like Mozambique and see even greater poverty. You can go to Malawi. You can go to Angola, Congo. Zambia is a whole lot better. You can go to Tanzania, Uganda. You'll see poverty like you've never seen before. And they are hemmed in by their, their worship of false gods and their forefather worship. And I saw in Haiti that's exactly what is going on. We should look and see what happens we should teach our children you want to go down this road and reject god let's take you to a place where god is rejected in their life or it's synchronism where they combine i mean the guy had a cross on and he was chanting stuff and he had skeletons and he had all kinds of horrid and terrible stuff uh, i wonder why the guy bothered going there it wasn't very pleasant that's what evil does it will drag you down eventually and We'll see how it doesn't drag you down immediately, but eventually it will. These are nations and peoples who have been steeped in this kind of false worship, not for 10 years, not for 50 years, not for 100 years, for centuries. In Africa, for centuries, they have been steeped in forefather worship, going back maybe to... 400 BC, when, when they moved down to Central Africa. And we wonder why it's so hard for the gospel to break through when we do it in our own strength. Because we're fighting years and years of, of um, false worship. And we have to trust God to break that. And God can break it as easy there as He can anywhere in the world. But we forget that. But we should learn from that. When mankind loses his moral compass, he will face God's justice in the sense of consequence. I always say there are two things. We have two legs. For the Christian, the right leg I, I like to use because I'm right-handed. The right leg is judgment. But God has forgiven me. 
I will not be judged one day. But the left leg is still on earth. And that's consequence. Don't think you can live as, your life as a Christian without consequences. Just doing as you please. And this is what's happened. Come and stand on the mountains of Samaria and look down on the Samarit or, or Samaria, Israel. It was the capital of Israel, the northern kingdom. Look at what God is doing. Listen, you live next to the pagans all your life. Six nations we saw. And instead of you influencing them, they have influenced you. Look at the church today. It's failing to influence the world around us. Instead, the world around us is influencing the church. The Lord does nothing without revealing to His prophets. You know, there comes a tipping point in a church, in a denomination, in a life, and in a nation. There comes a tipping point where only so far God will recognize that you're a sinner and give you mercy and grace and time. Look at the tipping point in the days of Noah. Remember God gave Noah about 70 to 100 years to build the ark. Some say 120. But mankind would not turn away from their iniquity. They looked at Noah and they continued in their sin. I want you to notice in the days of Noah, man was wicked and consumed with sin and only thought to do evil all the time. Guess what? That generation is upon us. Why do I say that? Our children are not being taught morals in school. Children are being taught what is right is wrong and what is wrong is right. Our children are being taught to be in as it was in the days of Noah. That's why I know time is short. What about the days of Lot? These are two things mentioned in the New Testament. Jesus in Matthew chapter 24 verse 37 and 39. He speaks that in the end time will be as such as in the days of Lot. You only have to read Genesis 19 and see the, the ugliness and the horror of mankind. The city of Sodom from east to west, from north to south. From young to old were evil to the very core. The scripture says that the whole city, young, old, north, south, east, west, went to debase these two angels. To have intercourse with these two angels who appeared as men. Lot was in such fear for what they would do to these angels that he offered his own daughters. Some people struggle with that. But I'm telling you, it's out of fear. He thought, can you imagine if these men have uh, relationships with these two angels, what will God do? Well, what did God do? Lot knew that. And his daughters weren't unmarried, by the way. And notice that their husbands were just as bad. And they left them behind to be destroyed. At the time that Antichrist will arise, Scripture informs us, it's best described in a single word, lawlessness, as in the days of Noah, as in the days of Lot. Can I finish the sentence? As in the days we live in, so fast approaching. They will have no moral compass. And that moral compass is being crushed day by day. We look at our children and our grandchildren and we wonder what is going to happen to them. When they grow up, will they wear pants or a dress? When they grow up, will they uh, be drug addicts? And, and because they've been taught it's okay to do what you want. If that's your will, just do it. Do whatever you want. I declare that these two factors the days of Noah and the days of Lot, what we learned from them is so strong. I remember one man standing once preaching on the end times. And he said, Behold, I think I hear the angel drawing his breath to blow the trumpet. We're in those days. The angel is filling his lungs and the trumpet, I believe, will be blown soon. <laughs> 
For the days of Noah and the days of Lot are here. The days of Lot most certainly. I just read chapter 19 of Genesis and I just thought, wow. Sodom is here. Not entirely throughout the world, but it's here. Thus says the Lord, verse 12, and who, who's read the book Crime and Punishment? I think it's by um, Dostoevsky. Crime and Punishment. Yep, worth reading. It'll leave you with a, with a, with a hole in your, your heart afterwards. He knew what he was doing. He knew he was killing. He knew that he was a, a bad man. And he would not repent. And he died or went to his death, as it were, or prison with that knowledge refusing to accept responsibility for what he did. And so we have a very interesting verse. Hear and testify against the house of Jacob, declares the Lord. There will be those who will testify against wickedness. And I just wonder, in my mind, sometimes runs a mock, a mock with these things. What God did with Israel, we read that passage about um, the lion, uh, the, the ear of the sheep being rescued from the lion. And there's a bit of a backstory to it. A shepherd would look after the sheep, and if a lion came, and dragged away one of the sheep, even though the, the sheep was dead, he would risk his life to rescue even an ear from the mouth of the lion and take it to the owner of the sheep and say, see, it, I didn't steal it. You can't expect me to pay for it. This was a, a lion that came and took the sheep away. And so that's the idiom that's there. That's what it's referring to. That God will leave a witness a testimony to his judgment upon Israel. And God will leave a testimony to his judgment upon man, upon woman, and upon young people if they do not turn and repent. And we see that God then goes on and indicts the elite of Israel. Hear and testify against the house of Jacob, declares the Lord, the God of hosts. That on the day I punish Israel for his tra tra transgressions, I will punish the altars of Bethel and the horns of the altars shall be cut off. In other words, God's first going to smash false religion. There's coming a day, as it was in, in Israel, where false religion, and maybe it will be the day the Lord appears, I don't know, where it will be exposed and it will be judged for what it is. It will turn to dust. Cut off means destroyed. Nothing will be left of it. And then God indicts the wealthy, the elite of Israel, for repression. Verse 15, He will strike the winter house along with the summer house, and the house of ivory shall perish, and the great houses shall come to an end, declares the Lord. And this is in reference to those who have gained their wealth by oppression, who have gained their wealth by corruption, who have gained their wealth. And you know, some people might make a lot of money because they're an inventor. They invent a wonderful thing and they become wealthy. And so they earned it in a good manner. But then what happens is they start to become oppressive. They start to become powerful and they want more and they want more and they start to become greedy and then they become an oppressor and all the good work they've done is overshadowed by their evil intentions. And they too will be cut off. Their house, their ivory house, will be destroyed. Their summer place and their winter place, you know, we, we, we have that here, but I don't think people come to ivory houses down here. But those will be destroyed. I need to conclude. Amos is a powerful message. God sees sin and God will judge sin. Whether through natural disasters, human iniquitous immoral acts, or human obsessions and greed. God will use those 
and God will judge them. And we know that for Israel, they only lasted, by the way, as a, as a people for about 175 years. Northern Kingdom, not the Southern Kingdom. After 175 years, approximately, maybe 150, maybe 200, somewhere there, they were carried off into Assyria and they never returned. There was a small remnant left to be a testimony, as Amos suggested. And if we look at the northern kingdom, they never had a godly king once. Not even one of their kings. I think 19 of them was godly. And one woman queen. And this tells us that God will look at the sinfulness of a nation. And offer them opportunity after opportunity to repent and turn back to Him. But the sad thing, and I think all three nations that are represented here, Canada, America and South Africa, we're in the same boat. Is there will come a day when God will say, enough. And I will take your land from you. Doesn't mean he's going to take you like out of the land like Assyria. Your land will be usurped by another. Your land you will lose to whatever legal things come into the country to take your land from you. In South Africa, they want to bring in a law called patriarchal uh, governance. In other words, no one owns a piece of land. Everything's owned by the government. You can only lease it for 25 years or 50 years, whatever they want. A patriarchal government. People will lose their land because they don't want a Christian government. They don't want a government that follows God. They want a government that will feed their pockets and help them in their selfishness. 150 years to 200 years is all that Israel lasted. But at the same time, it was God's grace and God's mercy. I just wonder today of Israel, modern Israel. Only 2% of Israel are Christians. I pray for revival in Israel. I plead with you. Pray for revival in Israel. Because I don't care what your theology is, what your eschatology is. If Israel do not repent, God can do nothing but judge them. We can't let our theology get in the way of what God says. Today, pray for Israel for revival. Pray to an end of Zionism, of atheism and pseudo-religion of Jeroboam that exists there even today. They follow things like the Kabbalah and things like that. Two percent have turned to the Lord in Israel. Pray for them. Pray for Western societies who are fast approaching that level. Where once, in one state in America, and I just can't remember which one it was, somewhere in the Bible Belt, 72% of people attend a church at least once a month. That was in 1950. What is it today? Just by the way, less than 30%. In South Africa, in 1993, they did a, 1992, they did a survey. We also had people who confessed to be Christians close to 70-something percent. It's a Christian country. By 2009, the same group did the same research with the same questioning. 32% confess to be evangelical Christians. Now, I'm excluding quasi pseudo Christian beliefs evangelical Christians 32% it was once claimed to be in the 70s as well unless they repent God will judge that nation unless churches live a, re a penitent light repenting of the things they have done of the the 
the lack of, of love for the body of Christ, the lack of love for Jesus and the work he's doing. I'm afraid God will judge that church. And unless a church repents, what do, what do we see in our churches today? I want to go to close with Noah and, and, and Lot. Noah, every man did as they wanted to. Evil was throughout the days of Noah. They looked at Noah and they mocked his godliness. He was the only righteous one. And God was gracious to them even then after 75 or 120 years of building the ark. Of being warned, God is coming upon you to judge you. Noah and his family enter the ark. And God leaves the door open for another seven days. Come, now is the time. And they don't. And so by water, the world is destroyed. At least sin is washed away. And then we come to Lot. In the days of Lot, Lot tried to warn them. Don't do this. Don't do it. Lot was not the most righteous man in the world, but he was righteous enough to say, don't do this. Stop. But they wouldn't. An angel, by the way, is a messenger. And these people of Sodom wanted to sodomize the messengers of God. Today, sodomy is in the pulpit. And lawlessness is in the church. How close are we? The church stands under judgment. And I can only ask, how long, O Lord? As Isaiah said, how long, O Lord? And my answer is honest to myself, not very long. It's time for the church to be pure. To purge itself. To be rid of our stupid things that we get so upset about. To turn to God's word, the pure word of God. To love this, this body. This body is part of the bride of Christ. We have no right to not love the body of Christ. And we must protect. Like Lot, standing in the doorway. And though they push you, though they shove you out the way, stand firm in the word of God.